What's going on everyone? Welcome back to the channel. Today's video is not about gameplay. It is about perks and educating everyone on those said perks. Now, in the last few days, I've been asked where, what perks do I need to focus on? What cards are they best on? Yada, yada, all those random questions that everyone has, especially when they see the amount of perks available. Sometimes it can be overwhelming. Sometimes you constantly think, oh, well, I messed up somewhere. Um, this isn't working because I've done it in the wrong fashion. I'm going to try my best in this video to explain the must have perks and why they are good. And then I'll do a brief summary of the other ones that follow that. There are 17 perks in the game right now, or not in the game, but there's 17 perks that will be ultimately available upon the release of Pirate Queen. And what is her name? Popstar. There we go. Came to my mind right as I clicked it. And Popstar. Popstar is going to be an ethereal summon card that you can only get from polls. Once you get her from polls, she'll be available in the store um, periodically, and you can get her copies from there. The Pirate Queen is only going to be available during uh, the Rift event that's going to be happening. I think it's called Astral Rift event. Um, I have no idea when that's going to drop. I'm hoping it's soon. It'll be a nice little add-on. Now, going into the perks. I'm going to believe you or be talking about the perks in a certain fashion. The gray ones will be common. The green ones will be uncommon. Blue is going to be rare. Purple is epic. Gold is legendary. And red is max level. Now, I do not have any legendary and I do not have any reds, but I will be mentioning them in the process of talking about the must-have perks in the game. Now, this said, I'm going to also do a disclaimer as well. This game has 17 perks. As of right now, there are 15 available. Every single perk has its place in the game. Every single perk has a reason to be used. Now, whether all those perks should be used is severely questionable. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine perks out of the 17 that are must haves in the deck for a reason. The other eight, technically six, one, two, three, four, five, six. The other six perks are what I would consider utility perks. The utility perks means they fit into the equation if necessary. And by I say if necessary is if you have four hexagon using cards and you want to use all four, that's where the utility comes in. There is only one hexagon perk that as of this moment, I believe is the best one to use. The others are situational and do have their places in the world. They're just not a must have right at this second. So starting all this off, when to level the perks. Now, that is a big question that I like to get out of my system first and foremost. A lot of new players to the game will have seven, level seven, level eight, and level nine cards. However, they will have the perks available. Now, the perk system or the perk levels are openly or are open up to level 79. To take a perk from epic to legendary, your card for that perk, so like Tech Golem's armor plating, Mako's bulwark. Tech Golem has to be level 12, Mako has to be level 12 for the perk to go to legendary status. Outside of that, you can take those perks from level 1 to level 79 basically immediately. Now, the problem that comes with that is the perks, along with your card levels, affect your might percentage. So if you only have five level 7 cards, but you have epic perks on all those cards, basically what you're going to run into is a lot of level 10, a level 11 decks that are going to stomp you into the ground. The reason why they're going to stomp you into the ground isn't because it's your fault or anything you've done wrong. It's just because they have more perks attached to them, they have higher damage, and they have higher health pools. So keep that in mind moving forward. And that's the reason why I say go with this strategy for your leveling card levels seven to nine your perk levels need to be a max common and that's it don't take them to uncommon don't take them past common it's not worth your struggle and it's not worth the headaches that will follow 
when these were released, a lot of us veterans for this game immediately started working up perks while we had level eight, level nine cards. Myself, and including myself in those regards, because I only had a couple that were level 10, so they only had two slots available, or the rest only had one. And when I went and took my perks past common into uncommon and into rare territory, I was starting to hit a lot of matchups where the cards for my opponent, whether it be a bot or a real person, real person, were a lot higher than me, and I was getting wiped clean. And it ultimately made me not want to play the game anymore because I pushed past my barrier and was into a realm I could not handle. So please follow this as I stated. Card levels 10 to 12, your max, or the perks need to be max uncommon or max rare, depending on your resources. When I say depending on your resources, I mean you have unlocked Rune Hunt for that week. You've maxed it out. You got all the runes. You got all of the little golden pieces here. The golden runes, I think that's what they're called. My mouse died. Nope, now we're good. You have your runes and you have your golden runes. Basically, these use get stockpiled up because of the rune hunt. If you have the battle pass unlocked, you'll get it from there. Same thing with the portal challenges on the weekend and through the weekdays. You get runes and golden runes from there as well. So just keep in fact or just keep in mind that you may have a stockpile of runes and golden runes until you hit level 10 to 12. It just happens that way. I'm sorry. Now, level 13 to level 14, max epic to legendary, that is going to be your sweet spot. All of my perks right now, I do realize that I'm kind of going a little ass backwards with what I said before about level or card levels 10 to 12. This is solely based on your entire lineup being those levels. My lineup outside of this build right here that I'm just tinkering with, Normally, I have three level 13s, a level 11, and another level 11 or a level 12. They're closer than anything else, but my max damage output is, between, is with the level 13s. So that's the reason why I have max epics. Again, I've tested this out to figure out where I went wrong and where I can handle my stuff. At 2400%, I was losing more often than not because I overreached, and it is possible to overreach. Card levels 15, obviously, you're going to have maxed out across the board. If your entire lineup is max level 15, your perks really need to reflect that. So, ultimately, you're going to be seeing a lot of legendary. You're going to see a lot of reds along that process. So, again, I'll just rest or restate this and everything else. Do as I say, not as I do is my main thing in life. I am hypocritical like nobody's business. I'm sure everyone notices this. I make the mistakes so you don't have to. Card levels 7 to 9. Perk levels max common. Card levels 10 to 12, max uncommon or max rare, depending on your resources. Card levels 13 to 14 is max epic to legendary. Card levels at max level is maxed out perks. I hope that helped. Even if that's even if the nine minutes of this video already, if that is enough information to help you, at least I know I've helped you. Now, let's go into the must-have perks and why. These are broken up into two sections, attack and defense. Attack has far more because there's very little defense. There's only four level D or only four defensive perks right at this moment. That's the reason why there's only a few defense perks. Attack, the primary, number one is landmine. This is the number one perk in the game and I will die on this hill. I have won games that I should not have won because of this perk. And I have lost games I should have won because I didn't get to this perk. Incendiary Landmine at the start of each round places an incendiary landmine at the square across the enemy's line symmetrical to her own. Once triggered, the landmine sets enemies in a small area on fire, dealing a percentage based on your perk's level of your hero's damage. Hero's damage over 10 seconds. Each second over 10 seconds. Just write out second for crying out loud. At level 20, the incendiary landmine explosion radius is increased. At level 60, the duration is increased to 10 seconds. When it's at level 19 and it's not at level 20, it is just for that square, then that square alone. At level 20 is when it plumes out and hits eight extra cards instead of just the one. That's where it becomes beneficial. This is the reason why it's number one. If you can... 
in a buff pattern area. We're going to label this out A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Basically like Battleship. If you put your landmine in sections B through B2 through B4 and C2 through C4, you are getting your max output of damage for the landmine. Now, landmine is a strategic perk. It is not to be one to be used willy-nilly. My clanmate Joy can attest to this. She whooped me because of my oversight and the fact i placed my landmine on i think it was b4 because all of her stuff was right here but i was first to uh, super out my card so i got locked into here she took all of her cards that were right here and shifted them over here to where she didn't get touched by it perfectly played on her end very poorly played on mine landmine is a situational card now if you are to get the card that has landmine supered first before your opponent, before any of your other stuff, try your hardest to get the placement into B3 or B4. Tap dead center of the board. That way, if they try and transition over, they're still going to get clipped. They're still going to get hit by it. It's still worthwhile unless they line themselves across the wall, which is ultimately the most impossible thing to do is keeping all of your cards completely away from a nine hit radius area so yeah it comes down to strategy it comes down to placements that's where it most matters that is the number one perk i tell everybody they need to level up they need to have you put this on your highest damage dealing circle perk using card mine currently sits on evil eye even though he's a level 10 his damage is three hundred thirteen thousand. The reason why it's on him, the damage output is sensational and it wipes everything clean, but I also place him far enough away from the opposition that he won't get attacked immediately. I surround him with Muerta and other cards such as Snoozemander, so they're the ones who get the attention, not him. Muerta will move forward. Snoozemander will move forward. Evil Eye stays stationary. Unless he's pulled in by Mako, he's the only one that displaces him. So ultimately, I surround him with everything else and protect him as best as humanly possible. Very rarely, but sometimes frequently, depending on the video and the day, I will put him in the B category or in the B section. But 99% of the time, let's say 90% of the time, I want him in the C section. That's where he's going to get the most effective. He's going to stay away from the scorched earth. He's going to avoid the incoming attacks from the uh, close melee people. And ultimately, that's where it's going to work the best. Just my suggestion. Moving on to number two. Number two is Onslaught. Onslaught is Griffin's perk. It deals a certain percent of damage based on your perk's level, extra attack damage while on the enemy's half of the board. The reason why this is a must-have is because of what happens when it gets leveled. Yes, the damage, extra damage output is amazing. However, at level 20, has a 15, or the card has a 15% chance to dodge attacks while on the enemy's half of the board. And at level 60, it increases to 45%. At level 100, once per round, you're going to rise from the dead, regardless of what's going on, with 50% of max HP and 50% of energy, if killed on the enemy's half of the board. This is a great closing perk ability. That means that it is best if you're like, you're facing four cards left, you have three cards, all of them have moved over, one of them drops and the other ones are pit or have moved past it because it's no longer there. It rises from the dead with its everything ready to go and just hits. It works perfectly on Griffin and Kitsune as the top two primary cards to use. I have seen people throw Onslaught onto Firestarter. Do not do that as the Firestarter has a very small, small window where he goes onto the opponent's side. When he goes into the bunker, he hits the entire board. Usually it's on your side. That's not going to trigger. Speaking of Firestarter, I'm going to put a quick pen in this and do a disclaimer again for a card that is very, very good, but ultimately lacks in the perk department, which is Firestarter. Firestarter is an amazing card. I love him. I think he does very well. He has. I have won many games because of him. I have lost many games due to him being on the opponent's side. The downside to Firestarter 
Perks don't work. Onslaught only works if he's on the other half of the board, which is very, very rarely. High Explosives only works if he's out of the bunker. Ricochet only works if he's out of the bunker. I thought for a while there that High Explosives and Ricochet would work while he's in the bunker, but the bunker is the ability. It is not an attack. So, with the fact that the bunker's ability is an ability and not an attack, that means the perks are shut off. Until he comes out of the uh, bunker and starts attacking again, that's when they work. So basically, you're getting maybe 30 to 40% of the time that the perks are being active, and that is going to get cut down to whatever percentage is the perks ability trigger. Just a disclaimer. So the only ones that really work on him are the defensive perks. Scorched Earth holds no value because his damage is so low because his attack speed is so high. Same thing with Hocus Pocus, Landmine, and Swamp. His damage is so low that these essentially do nothing. They tickle. They don't actually finish off targets like they're supposed to. Those barely work. So ultimately, it's Ray of Light and a defensive perk that work on him, and that's it. Now, back to the perks. We're going on to Ricochet. Ricochet is the Gunslinger's perk. Attacks have 30% chance to also deal 186% of hero's damage to random nearby enemies. This perk is a must-have because of how many cards have tokens. Muerta and uh, Jelly Knight are basically everywhere now. Everyone likes those. Everyone uses them because they're very, very good. They pop out tokens. Muerta does her skeleton, and Jelly Knight does his slime. With Ricochet, you have a higher chance of deleting out all of those clusters of tokens in a brief moment. So, say Jelly Knight's slimes are coming towards him, and you happen to hit him, Ricochet triggers, it's going to bounce off to the random slugs right behind him and kill them off, hopefully buying you a little bit of time to take him out while he's regening his health. Same thing with Muerta. Muerta drops the crypt, the skeletons come out, Ricochet hits, those bounce out, wiping out the skeletons, giving you a chance to actually go at Muerta before she hits another crypt. That's why it's a must-have. It is awesome, and it helps wipe out a lot of things. At level 60, it gets increased to 50%. At level 100, number of ricochet targets increases to 2. So, oh, nearby enemy. So, it has a chance to bounce off to a secondary target, or three targets at once. I personally prefer putting Ricochet on Little Red because of her attack speed and her damage output, but I also prefer it on Draco. Draco's innate ability allows for him to hit three targets anyways. So, with the best possible RNG luck, at level 60, it is completely possible to hit six targets with his basic damage instead of just an additional one. That's why that one works out so well. And Draco is one of the meta cards that is still seen today and is still very, very good. Yeah. All right. Next one up is Swamp. It is our newest perk given to us from Witch. At the start of each round, it creates a wide 10 second swamp at the center of the board. Board? Void? At the center of the board, enemies in the swamp are poisoned, taking 74.8% of heroes' damage per second. It's percent, the percentage based is based off the perk level. At level 20, enemies in the swamp get incurable wound, which means they cannot receive healing. That means it negates out Ray of Light. So if you have, or if your opponent's Jelly Knight has Ray of Light on it, and that triggers to a Tech Golem and a Kitsune right next to him, or a Griffin and a Kitsune right next to him, they're going to be regenerating until they hit the swamp. Once they hit the swamp, the Swamp negates out that Ray of Light regeneration and puts them back into a susceptible kill range. At, they're at level 60, at the 15 seconds of each round, create another Swamp at the same location for 10 seconds. So ultimately, that means in the five, or within 5 seconds of the Swamp ending, it's going to hit again for another 10 seconds. You have 5 second window where there is no Swamp. That works out very, very well to a certain extent. It allows for you guys or for the enemy to have a chance for a mild comeback if your tanks or frontline is still holding them into place. Swamp pairs out very, very nicely in decks that have Tech Golem, Treant, Kitsune, and there's one other one. I just had it a minute ago. Mako. That's the other one where it works out nicely. With Mako, 
He's up front. He pulls in the people from behind, or the back line that goes onto the swamp, which they are in turn getting poisoned. Treant ability stuns everything in an AoE. So that means that they're going to be stunned in the swamp, taking more damage. Tech Golem, with the right defensive perks, can actually stand in the swamp with the op or with the opposing uh, cards, eating up all of that damage and deflecting because he's such a beefy boy with the defensive perks that they're all sitting there taking more damage. So ultimately, the entire front line is taken care of at that time. I've won a lot more because of this and applying it to my decks and than I did before. The next one up is Scorched Earth. That is Draco's ability or perk. At the start of each round, set the enemy's last row on fire, dealing percentage based on your perk's level of hero's damage per second over a certain amount of seconds, depending on your level, to enemies in the area. At level 20, the duration is 10 seconds. At level 60, the duration is increased to 15 seconds. And at level 100, it sets an additional row on fire. So, that said, it sets one additional row on fire. I have not seen a level 100 Scorched Earth, so I can neither confirm nor deny this. But in the context of the verbiage, it makes me think it can be a, a random slot. Now, that's just based off what it says. However, logic dictates it's going to be the third and fourth row. That's the logic behind it. So that means two rows are getting taken out with the fire for, ten, or for 15 seconds. It's very, very beneficial to take out the back line. Now, all of that said, I have to point this out. The reason why Landmine, Swamp, and Scorched Earth are must-haves is if you have all three in your lineup, which for the longest time, I had, swamp, or I had Swamp, Scorched Earth, and Landmine all on Muerta. That means you're covering the entire board with damage. Now, there is a pro and con that comes from putting all three of those perks on one card. The pro on the right card it's going to do the max amount of damage and if that card is supered quickly that means that one card is making sure all damage is coming from them and they are reigning supreme the con that comes from it is if rng is not in your favor for that match and you did not pull that card until the very end you ultimately have three dead perks so i highly recommend split or spreading them out as of late i've been doing landmine on evil eye swamp on Muerta and Scorched Earth on Griffin. They are three of the highest damage dealers in my deck. They are three staples to each deck I build. And ultimately, spreading that out means that I have three different chances for it to go off. And if one of the cards does not get supered, the other two cards are still doing the damage necessary, and I'm just making up that difference. It comes within the strategy of play. That's just my suggestion. Take it, leave it, do whatever you want with it. That's up to you, not to me. The last attack perk that is a must-have is Lightning Reflexes. It is Kitsune's perk. It increases the attack speed, our hero's attack speed, by a certain amount of percentage based on your perk's level. But at level 20, it increases your movement speed by 15. At level 60, it increases the movement speed by 30. Lightning Reflexes on Griffin turns him into God Mode. If you can put on Griffin Onslaught, may, or Tech Golem's Armor Plating, and Lightning Reflexes, all of which are level 79 or higher, Griffin becomes very hard to handle. If you are able to stack his Restore Health Combat Boost abilities, Griffin cannot die. I have seen it a few times. It's really, really fun to watch, but it's really, really painful to play against. If you can stack the 30% and the 20% for Griffin's Restore Health with those three perks on him, he is God Mode. He cannot die. It's, uh, it's the most broken thing in the game. 100%. But it's very rare that you see those unless you are one of those players that has a max level team and you are top 10 of the leaderboard and what you are fighting is other top 10 players. You'll see that there. You won't necessarily see it very often as you're lower down on the might and the percentage, but you will see hints of it as you move along. And I think that is all the attack perks. Lightning Reflex is also one of the key portions I meant to put this out here. 
is for cards like Buddy and for Evil Eye. Buddy and Evil Eye have a two second attack speed. With it being leveled up to like level 100, it turns Buddy and Evil Eye into machine gun cards. Buddy has the ability where every three attacks, I believe it is, each attack against the same enemy target, Buddy makes a... Oh, after three attacks, Buddy makes a piercing shot, dealing 577,000 damage to the target and the enemies and to enemies in a wide area behind it. He doesn't need energy. His attack speed is two seconds. So ultimately, this ability is good because he's increasing his attack speed by 60% up to 300%. With the lightning reflexes on him at a high enough level, this beginning portion of Buddy's ability doesn't really apply. He's already going super, super fast. He is already becoming a machine gun, and his, he's doing his piercings a lot more. Using Buddy with his incurable wound combat boost increase and lightning reflexes, generally, you are going to watch a tech golem with the tech uh, armor plating and paladin plating and Mako's bulwark on him disintegrate. It's hilarious. I love this little doggo because of those perks. Without those perks, he's dog water. No pun intended. Moving on. Our defensive perks. Now, I know you all are thinking it's going to be all the squares. It's really not. There's only two squares here that are worth a defensive perk. I guess Scorched Earth is an attack on the square, but we'll just negate out what I said earlier. Armor plating for Tech Golem is the number one defensive perk. The reason for that is not only are you getting extra HP off of this, you're going to take 15% less damage during the first seven seconds at level 20. At level 60, you're taking 30% damage for the, during the first seven seconds of each round. At level 100, you're gaining immunity to damage during the first 10 seconds of the round. So at level 100, the armor plating basically means you can put whatever card it's on anywhere. Landmine's not going to hurt it. Scorched Earth's not going to hurt it. Swamp's not going to hurt it. Ultimately, they're just a walking ball of invincibility for 10 seconds. That shifts the tide of battle more often than not. And honestly, when I see this, when I see a level 100 uh, armor plating, I tend to retreat very, very quickly. Because I know at a certain, at, at level, or at a 10 prowess, I'm not going to hurt them anymore. They're not going to take damage. If I'm lucky and can control them, with like evil eye or the fear, cool. But outside of that, it doesn't really work. Or it doesn't, it just means you're gonna win. This is just my experience. Everybody else can tell me I'm wrong, but yeah, level 100 armor plating is just ridiculous to fight against. The next one up is Bulwark from Mako. You're gonna ignore a certain amount of percentage based off of your perk level of incoming damage while on their half of the board. What that means is not it doesn't trigger if you're or it stays triggered if you're on their half of the board. If you are on your half of the board and they come over to your half of the board, bulwark does not trigger off of their damage. It's ultimately just dead in the water right there. So bulwark, the reason why it's a necessity in my opinion is by ignoring the damage that's coming in, you do have a chance to ignore the damage from Swamp, Landmine, and Scorched Earth. You have uh, you ignore the damage coming in from like an Evil Eye or something that's covering the entire board. Stuff, <coughs> excuse me, stuff like that. But also, at level 20, you're gonna get 10% extra HP, which does not seem like a lot, but it does, or it has saved me quite a few times. I put Bulwark onto uh, Muerta, and she did survive by a sliver of health from a landmine, which ultimately won me the game because I was able to get out the crypt and the skeletons because she was still alive. At level 60, you're going to get 25% extra HP. And at level 100, allies in a small area around the hero also ignore 75% of incoming damage. At level 100, this is where you are going to ultimately want to put this on a card that is going to be around a landmine or be around the Scorched Earth along with the other ones. This is going to allow you to ultimately save a few cards that will win you the game as it's progressively leveled. In the beginning stages and everything for the uncommon, or for the common uncommon realm, it's okay. It's decent. It does do well. 
basically it's a must have because of the latter part of its ability level ups. Finally, <coughs> excuse me. Finally, at the last defensive perk that is a must have is Gambler's perk, Hocus Hocus. At the start of each round, you're going to deal 225% based off of the level. This is what I'm at of heroes damage to the closest enemy in the same column and teleport them back. What that means is whatever is immediately in front of your card on the opposing side, that's what's going to get shot back. The reason why this is a must have is yes, there is swamp now, but this helps against a tech golem with the armor or armor plating kitsune with uh, weakness no lightning reflexes if the kitsune has lightning reflexes it's going to stall for a second but she's going to jump right back into the fight ultimately what this is main for and the reason why it's a necessity is this is to displace what they are going to use to disrupt your end it can also one shot basically everything from tier three down or tier four down i should say anything that's not supered if your card is supered with this on there it immediately erases them just because of their health pool so that's the reason why that's on there and a, and a must have there are people who will go and say eh, hocus pocus is good but it's not really great it is though because really if you think about it if you have hocus pocus you have swamp and you have uh incendiary landmine and scorched earth right you went and had muerta who has say landmine scorched earth and hocus pocus which i ran for quite some time you have those there and then you have evil eye just for an example with swamp right basically what's going to happen is you're going to blink back the card so say you blink back the kitsune your landmine is on the b b section she's going to get hit with the landmine she's going to get hit with the hocus pocus she's going to get hit with the scorched earth and then she's going to get hit by the swamp when she returns to battle. So she's getting four hits off of the perks to ultimately wipe her out before her ability goes off. Now, this all being said, all the damage from each one of the perks does put energy into going to an ability. It gives the cards energy. That's what it is. Energy is drawn from both attacks, outgoing, and incoming. So, if it's hit by, or if Kitsune is hit by four perks, most likely her ability is going to be active by the time she gets up to your cards, which is a downside. However, if enough damage is sent in her direction, she will be erased before she gets to your cards to set off the ability. That's why it's in here. That's why it's so good. Every single one of the perks I just mentioned as a must have all work together in a beautiful cocktail of chaos enough that it can win you games i have used all of these perks in one lineup and i have been able to wipe out a lineup that is max level across the board that's why they're so good that's why i just want to point that out sorry i've recorded this three times already my brain's a little dead now the remaining perks we're just going to kind of over or look over them for a minute, read the description and go from there. These are what I like to call utility perks. As you can tell, I have three, six, eight, 10, 12 perks available in this lineup alone out of 15 perks available. So ultimately what I did was being strategic, getting the card placements. I have every single slot filled. The utility perks that are what I'm about to mention are integrated into this because they help in some fashion or another. We're going to start this off with recoil. Recoil is gearheads perk. Upon taking melee damage, there is a 75% chance to deal 60.5% of received damage to the attacker. The chance is increased to 75% at level 20. It's increased to 100% at level 60. The reason why this is a utility perk is say I have Griffin and Kitsune on my or on my lineup. Griffin is going to have or say I have Griffin, Kitsune, Evil Eye. There it is. Griffin, Kitsune, Evil Eye. Evil Eye has the lightning reflexes to increase his attack. Griffin is going to have, let's say, let's just say for shits and giggles, he's going to have the lightning reflexes because I want him to move faster. I want him to be a god. 
Kitsune needs a hexagon. That's where recoil comes in. It becomes the utility. I can put recoil on Griffin so Kitsune has the lightning reflexes, but I don't feel like it's going to hurt anything having it on either one. Lightning reflexes clearly is the card I want to have in here, so, or the perk I want to have. So that's how that's going to go. It can fit, or uh, recoil can fit in one of the melees that are up front because I need a perk slot filled. Daydreams is following that. Daydreams is Snooze Mander's perk. It applies weakness or has a certain percentage chance, has 20% chance to apply weakness, increasing enemies' incoming damage by 78%, which means they're going to take more damage. That's just the way the words, wording is kind of weird. It took me a minute to figure that out. At level 60, the chance is increased to 40%, which is nice. The reason why this is a good little add-on is for cards like Buddy. Buddy has double hexagon as his perk slots at level 10. So what I did with him when I had him for my rune hunt was he had lightning reflexes and weakness. Basically, the lightning reflexes increase the attack speed, allowing for him to have better chances of hitting the weakness onto the opponents, further shredding them down. That's why it's a utility card. I don't necessarily put daydreams just all willy-nilly. It goes on cards that have very high attack speed. You need to have the high attack speed so you have a better chance of that 20% triggering. Just to keep that up, that's the reason why it's utility. The Paladin armor plating is different. The reason why it's a utility in my eyes is because it does the shield does explode at level 20, dealing 75% of hero's damage. It is a ener using an energy costing ability, cast a 10 second shield on self for 25.2% of the hero's HP. So it was 25.1% at one. Or at level one, because it's only a level two. Basically, this is like Mako with his ability. Oddly enough, it's coming from Paladin. Oh, Paladin's combat boost gives a shield when the ability triggers. That's the reason why. So ultimately, what this means is that you can throw this onto, say, like a Griffin. When he goes to jump to the back line, he's going to get a shield that gives him his health back. If he gets attacked and the shield breaks, it's going to deal more damage, further killing off whatever he's attacking at. The downside to this is if he's hit by a long range attack and there's nothing around him, and the shield breaks I just wasted the shield the, there's no extra damage. It was just a body. That's really what it, or it was just a, a just a shield. It mitigated some of the damage coming at him. It's only increased by 0.1%. So as the levels go up, it's only going to really it's not really going to go very, very high. I'm sure it could it's just not. So keep that as what it is. I'm sure that come in time, like level 60, when Destroy the Shield stuns nearby enemies for two seconds, I'm sure that'll be handy. It'll be just be situational. So that's where the armor plating comes in here. I would personally put this on any and all tanks, really, or onto Firestarter, just so if he's being attacked in melee range by like a Kitsune or a Griffin or something, he explodes out of the bunker, lighting the area on fire. So adding the shield exploding on top of that will actually help erase some things that are attacking him, just not necessarily everything. Again, this is the reason why it's a utility. Ray of Light is the next one. Ray of Light is Angel's perk. At the start of each round, allies immediately flank in the hero, gain regeneration for 10 seconds, recovering 8.2% of, of HP per second. That's the hero's HP, not the one that has the perk. If I'm wrong, a developer needs to tell me or someone needs to show me the numbers here. At level 20, the duration is increased to 10 seconds. At level 60, it applies to all heroes in that row. And at level 100, while Ray of Light is in effect, the heroes are immune to control effects. So that means they're immune to Evil Eye's uh, leash. They're immune to stuns. They're immune to fear. Really, that's what that, those three, that's what that comes down to. It's a good it's a good perk. It's a good thing for other supports to have. It's a good thing as a filler if you have all your circle perks taken up and there's still one remaining. It's good for that. Um, personally, I put this on to Jelly Knight 99% of the time. However, it is negated out by the swamp. So just keep that in mind. So if you are playing Jelly Knight with the Ray of Light, and your opponent has a Swamp perk that is level 20 with Incurable Wound, 
what I recommend is putting into a strat or putting in a new strategy. Set your Jelly Knight back a little bit to where it's around something that's stationary, like a Muerta, Lava Girl, something like that, to where they're benefiting from the regeneration and they're not getting hurt by the swamp because they're not all the way up there just yet. It's the only real time I would apply Ray of Light in that scenario. High Explosives. <coughs> Excuse me, I need to take a quick drink. High Explosives is Duckwing's perk. At level 20, the chances increase to 20% to deal a certain amount of percentage based on your perk's level of hero's damage. Oddly enough, this is on this is Duckwing's perk, and Duckwing has a very low attack damage, so that's kind of funny to me. But it works out relatively well on fast attacking cards. So ultimately, if I'm not running Ricochet, or if I have Ricochet on say Draco, but I also have Little Red Cap, I'll throw high explosives on there just to give Little Red a little bit of a leg up. But outside of that, it's not something I go to immediately. I prefer the splash damage from Ricochet in lieu of just the single target damage from high explosives. You can also throw this onto Griffin if your onslaught's on something else, but really, if you're running a Griffin, you need to be running onslaught. That's just how that goes. The last one is Eldritch Horror. Eldritch Horror is another new perk introduced to the game. It is Evil Eyes perk. At the start of each round, cast two seconds of fear on enemies in its line. So basically like Hocus Pocus, but for everything in that line. Enemies debuffed by Eldritch's Horror Fear effect take 71.6% of hero's damage per second. This perk pairs beautifully with Lich. If you are a Legion of Darkness fan like myself, you can go and do Evil Eye, Muerta, and Lich. Lich having uh, high explosives and ricochet with Evil Eye having, or Evil Eye having, um, not Evil Eye, uh, another card on your team with an hexagon having Eldritch Horror. I generally put it on Griffin just because I can. But ultimately, the reason why that works is they have increased damage towards feared targets for combat boosts. And it really works out nicely that the, the enemies are feared for that minute or for that few seconds. So there's increased damage coming at them while they're taking increased damage because of the fear. So it does work out very, very well. It is a utility card meant to displace. It is not meant as a primary to be your primary damage going out. It is just a utility card. Now, at level 60, it does get more interesting. When the fear wears off, you apply stun for two seconds. So this actually works out well with incendiary landmine. If everything is feared and they're running around after being hit with a landmine, they're taking that damage, but then they're going to get stunned for two seconds further taking more damage. If you are lucky enough, you can actually have them fear run into the scorched earth or run into the swamp. And if they do that and then they're stunned for two seconds, they're taking the additional damage of the scorched earth and the swamp. That is where that utility comes into place. That's where a control factor comes into play. So I highly do. I do recommend leveling up Eldritch Horror, but after the initial eight that I talked about, one, two, three. No, sorry. Initial nine, excuse me. The initial nine perks I talked about. So, that's going to be the end of this video. These are all the perks that are available now. When Popstar gets released, I will be doing a video on her perk because I feel like it's really, really good. It's called Enchanting Music. Once per 10 seconds, it buffs three allies attack damage by 40% for three seconds. I'm sure that 40% will increase with the levels. Um, generally, the percentage is what is increased with the levels. At level 20, the, or the duration is increased to five seconds. At level 60, it's going to also restore 200 energy. And at level 100, allies buffed by enchanting music cannot drop below 1 HP. That is Popstar's ability. Popstar's ability does uh, increase the damage. All of this is her ability. At level 100 is her primary ability. It keeps all the targets or all the targets enchanting with enchanted music from dropping below 1 HP, which can shift the tide of battle. I'm looking forward to her as one of the best supports in the game. Um, in my opinion, she's a better version of uh, I think she's a she's a better version of Aqua and Valkyrie. They all basically kind of do the same thing of increasing the dam or allies attack damage. 
but making sure that they don't drop below one HP is honestly very, very good, especially during the ability. So this is something to look out for. Shark Tornado is Pirate Queens, and I did talk about this in regards to Firestarter, but this is going to be very, very, very good for a majority of cars that run Diamond. I think this is going to be a must-have as well. The Tornado triggers every 10 seconds at level 20. At level 60, Heroes Caught in the Tornado lose 50 energy per second. So that's 500 energy lost within the 10 seconds. And then at level 100, the Tornado stuns enemies for one second. And from Just from looking at this, I do see it being very, very beneficial. I see it being an awesome displacer. I do see it being a problem if you try and pair our Eldritch Horror with Shark Tornado. You're going to have to do your placements very thoroughly. You're going to have to be strategic about your placements. But that being said, Shark Tornado, Eldritch Horror, Scorched Earth, Swamp, and Landmine, I think are going to be five perks that you're going to see ran together continuously because they combo so well together and they displace everything on the field. So just keep your eyes out for that. It will be available during the Astral uh, Rift event that I hope is coming up soon. So just kind of keep your eyes out for that. If you're a new player and you've reached the end of this video, I do highly recommend save resources until you have a lineup that you are really liking. Work those initial nine perks up to the levels based off of what you have. Work those ones up and then work all the other stuff in between after that. The utility cards are meant to be for higher advanced play. The must-haves are for all circumstances. So I'm going to stop my rambling and I'm going to leave you the same way I always do. Life can be fun. You allow it to be. We'll see you next time.